It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, I have with me Andy Grabner, my co-host. Andy, how are you doing today? Really good. I'm really good. Sitting here in lovely Boston again, still waiting for spring. It hasn't shown up yet, so uh, well, if it's you, the same. I keep repeating it. Yeah, if you put some boots on, you can at least have a spring boot. <laughs> Bad <laughs> joke. Uh, um, hey, you know what? You mentioned you sent an email earlier to me, Andy, and I had no, I wasn't even paying attention. Uh, by the time this episode's air airs, um, dear listeners, we'll be on our, we'll be beyond our two year anniversary. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was looking, well. I was looking back at the speaker content. And it looks like the first air episode aired on May fifth of twenty sixteen. So, I had no idea, and I'm really surprised that I haven't said something to get me fired yet. So. I'm really happy that we're still here. <laughs> yeah. And not only are we here, but we also have Donovan Brown back on the show. Hey, Donovan, yes. are you with Yes, I am here. I'm hearing about how it feels in Boston. And it's miserable here, too, in Houston. It's, it's 75 <laughs> degrees, and, and I've had enough of this temperature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rub it in. That's all. <laughs> it's gorgeous here. It is sunny. Yeah. It is 75, and it's just beautiful. So, I, yeah, you know there's places in the United States that where it doesn't snow, right? Yeah, I heard yeah, about you, them. Just yeah, you live there too. Tales. Yeah, we're, we're 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 only hitting the upper sixties today in Denver, so it's you know, it's not too bad. Nah, not too. I can I can live with it. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Sixties are not too shabby. Seventy five though, I'll I'll take it. Yeah. So Donovan, the reason why we we obviously wanted to record more episodes with you is because you are the DevOps master from, from Microsoft <laughs> and DevOps advocate, DevOps ninja, DevOps uh, black shirt man, right? And, and one, one big piece, I mean, last time we heard from, you know, Microsoft DevOps transformation, and that was pretty cool. Today, cool. we want to talk more about, you know, continuous delivery, building pipelines. And then one thing that is very dear to our heart, especially Brian and mine, is is using monitoring earlier in the pipeline and how we can leverage monitoring for early feedback. And I think what people call shift left or maybe there are other terms. Um, but I think that's what I want to discuss and also get your perspective and opinion on it, how maybe you at, at Microsoft, you're doing it, but in general, what you're advocating for when it comes to building delivery pipelines with, with uh, monitoring baked in. Well, I think it's crucial that you have the monitoring baked into your pipeline because the whole goal is to deliver value. And you can't just add a new feature and assume that you've delivered value. Most We're always monitoring, even if you're not doing it very well. A lot of us monitor just our bottom line. Did we make money or did we not make money? Right, And they assume that if they made money, then that they're doing things really well. But I think it's more important to understand what were the actions that you took that allowed you to make more money. You need to dig a little bit deeper than just the bottom line. And that's where monitoring comes in. It allows you to look at the path that the user took through your application. Yeah, maybe you did make a lot more money this quarter, but was it because of the feature that you added? Was it a promo that you were running? Was it you're now higher in search results than you were a month ago? If you don't understand what caused that movement, you can't go do more of that, right? And you're just uh, guessing that, oh yeah, it must have been that cool new feature I told you to add. See, I told you it was a good idea and <laughs> realizing that it had absolutely nothing to do with the movement of your of your bottom line. So I think monitoring is is crucial to make sure that you understand and can quantify what was it that we did that made this improvement so that we can go do more of that and also answer the question, was the feature that we just delivered, which hopefully if you're doing Agile and Scrum correctly, you're working on the most important thing first, was it truly the most important thing? Did it really have an impact on our development? And if you don't monitor your application once it's deployed into production, you're just guessing that it was. But now mm -hmm. there's no reason to guess. I mean, you could actually see that, yes, 95% of the people that visited our website used that new feature and that turned into revenue uh, because they added items to their basket that were on that page. And you can start to make sense of the movement and not just looking at the bottom line. So I think it's, it's mm -hmm. crucial to be successful. 
Yeah. So, but in this case, you're talking about, you know, obviously monitoring how users react to your new feature, as you said, right? And instead of having an anecdotal uh, fact, well, instead of having anecdotes, you're actually basing it on facts. I think that's what, it, what the key thing is. But what about monitoring even earlier before? before things hit production. So one thing that we've been advocating for is actually using monitoring as part of your CI CD, meaning when you are pushing a new code change through the pipeline, already using the same metrics, the same monitoring that it would use later on in production to figure out you know, uh, how heavy is my feature on resource consumption, whether it's memory, whether it is uh, how, you know, how does garbage collection change, how many log files are we generating, how many database statements are we executing. So looking at some of these metrics early on to give a developer already feedback minutes after he committed the code to say, hey, your code change has potential impacts because you just increased the number of round trips to the database by 10%. And then combining that with production data where we can see, hey, your feature is actually used by 90% of the people. And if you're now increasing the database round trips by 10%, that translates to that many more round trips to the database. Are you aware of that? Is this something you're also advocating for? Absolutely. And it's interesting because I don't want to do anything in production for the first time. It should have been tested in QA. It should have been tested in staging. It should be tested in dev. And that includes the telemetry that we're going to collect. Right? I can't assume or ignore it in dev and QA and assume that I'm going to get good numbers out in production. I might Because I also think of it from a developer's perspective of custom telemetry that you're going to put in it as well. That's telemetry that is literally coded into the product. When this action happens, please send me some type of information that I can aggregate later. I have to test in dev that I'm actually actually getting the numbers out of the system. And I'm going to distribute that application to my beta testers and my QA testers and have them use the app and then go review those numbers. It's like, yep, those are the buckets I thought the numbers would be going into. Based on your usage, these numbers look accurate. Perfect. We can now push that out into production. So anything that's going to happen into production, I don't care if it's monitoring or performance tuning or bug fixes, needs to be tested throughout every stage of your pipeline. So I, I violently agree with what you're saying. You know what I would add to that one too? In terms of testing your telemetry in in that development phase testing the validity of your telemetry in that phase so go ahead and collect the data that you think you want to collect and besides figuring out as you mentioned is it collecting the, is it collecting data and then is the data telling me what i thought it was going to tell me finding out if that those metrics are actually useful in helping you make decisions no that's great because you you have to have a question that you're trying to answer that's the reason for the telemetry. And a lot of a lot of times I get asked a very generic question. Okay, Donovan, we're all excited about telemetry and monitoring. Where should we put it? And I just shrug at them. I'm like, I don't know where you should put it. I, I know where we put it because we were looking to answer a particular question. But the, be, don't ask me where the telemetry needs to go. Ask yourself, what is it that we're struggling with it? What is it that we need to know about our system? And then that will tell you what to monitor, how often to monitor it, and where to put that custom telemetry. So I think that's a, that's a very personal question. It's like, what should we monitor? Well, it depends on what it is that you're looking for. And you should be looking for something, in my opinion. You shouldn't just put monitoring everywhere because eventually you have so much data, you don't even know what you're looking at or looking for at that point. Right. And then testing that that, that data is actually useful before you go to production so that Absolutely. you're not sitting there wasting your time with a bunch of metrics and data that aren't adding to uh, you know, the success of the project and you can, right. you can test your testing data in a way. <laughs> yeah. Because you I mean that, that you produce, well, we produce petabytes of data. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you don't want that to be wasted space because that's literally what it is. It's taking up space somewhere and it's going to make combing through that data even that much more difficult when the volume continues to increase. So you want to collect what you need to be able to answer that question quickly and efficiently. And you don't want to just be collecting data just for data's sake. You, you should be looking for something. Yeah, but you could just put it in the cloud. It's free. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> as long as it's Azure, knock yourself out. Mm. <laughs> so I, I, I like that. So basically what you're saying is when it comes to monitoring, 
as a development team, you want to actually define what is relevant for you to have. What piece of information is it that you want to have in the downstream environment, whether it is UAT or staging or performance or production, and then validating all these stages that the data comes in, that is actually valid data and that it's actionable. So that's one aspect of putting, kind of making sure that everything is monitored correctly, kind of defining what you want to see, maybe putting in some custom telemetry, uh, and then maybe defining the dashboards and educating people downstream. Hey, here are some new things that I want you to monitor. Now, what about another concept that I call it monitoring as code, uh, but I'm not sure if you know this is some term that I just came up with or maybe somebody else did too. For me, it is something where if I'm a developer and I build a new feature and then my business team says, well, this feature has to respond in a certain time. It should only, you know, cost us so much in terms of how much does it cost to run it on a certain infrastructure. Then these are actually uh, requirements, not functional requirements, but more performance and resource consumption requirements that I could potentially put into a config file, like a JSON file, a YAML file, or even my code, right? Uh, and and then what, I'm at, uh, what I've been advocating, and Donovan, this is where I want to get your feedback on, every time I push a build through the pipeline, and I know that this particular service that I'm pushing through should be able to respond within 100 milliseconds when it's been hit by 50 TPS transactions per second, and it should be able to run on, let's say, a particular container with a particular size. I mean, if I have specified this in my config files, then I can take this config file and put in a quality gate in my pipeline and say, okay, every time Andy is pushing a code change, I'm deploying it, I'm running the test to simulate 50 TPS, and then I'm looking at the monitoring data and say, okay, how many resources do we need, and what's the response time, and what's the failure rate, and uh, do we have, how many dependencies do we have to other services? So this is what I've been advocating for monitoring as code. So as a developer, I check in these specifications with my source code, and then it can be automatically validated in the pipeline. Is this something that you've also seen other people do? Is this something that actually makes sense, or is this too early in the stage? What, what's your take on that? No, I've, it's interesting hearing you describe that, because what it sounded like you were describing at first was just what we normally do with performance testing, right? There's a bottleneck or there's an SLA that we have to adhere to. So we basically stand up a test rig that can generate that load and then verify that we can meet the SLA that we've actually put in place. But you've taken it, or it sounds like you're trying to take it a step even further than that, because the building of the rig and the configuring of the the uh, thresholds and the alerts would all happen external to the piece of software. I would have another piece of software where I'm going to be doing my performance and load testing. I would set the thresholds. I would configure the test to run, and then I would just go beat this poor little app to death. And then I would go watch the metrics from that d device to determine if I met my SLA. But it sounds like you're trying to put that in code somehow. So then my question would be, what application – is reading that config file and then configuring your test rig to then go generate the appropriate load and watch the current metric. So it sounds like an interesting idea, but technically having built rigs before, I'm thinking, okay, I don't know what app you're using that can read that file and then configure itself to not only generate the load, but then read the right perf mons off of the machine to be able to know, am I looking at uh, database connections? Am I looking at database round trips? Am I looking at CPU utilization? Am I looking at disk utilization? There's so many metrics you have to look at and configure as part of your testing that has nothing to do with the app, right, to set those thresholds. So I'm just kind of curious of what is the what is the product that you're using that can then read from source control the definition of the configuration and test and then go generate that test for you? Yeah, I mean, in my case, you know, for monitoring, I mean, obviously we are using Dynatrace and I've been using my own JSON file format that I call MonSpec monitoring as code and my pipeline itself. So into pipeline, I, I, I wrote these integrations now for uh, with Node.js. So I wrote a little Node.js function that is basically reading that property file. And then it is reaching out to the monitoring tool and say, hey, we just deployed this particular version of the app into the, into the test environment. We're currently running tests against it. So I'm not standing up the test exactly. Ah. In the, I'm, not, I'm not yet generating the tests, but that would actually be the next thing. But what I have in this config file, as a developer, I can say, here is my service. 
you can detect this service in the different stages by looking at this metadata. So every time when we deploy a service into a different environment, whether it's dev, test, or prod, we can pass metadata like the stage name or the service name, and all this gets picked up as a tag, as metadata. So I can actually ask the monitoring tool, give me the uh, response time, the CPU utilization, the number of database queries from this particular service that is running in this particular environment and give it to me from the last 30 minutes when I knew I ran some tests. And then I'm using this and then validate it against what my developer wants me to validate it against. And I can actually either specify, let's say, hard-coded SLA, so if I really have a hard limit, but I can also say compare it to a different environment. So for instance, compare it to production, because if I'm building a continuous delivery pipeline, my point of view is, I never want to push something through the pipeline that is uh, resulting in a worse state than we currently have in production. But production should always be my golden standard. So everything I do should be at least the same or improving production. So when I push something through, I can also say, hey, we're pushing it into a testing environment that is on the load and look at the values from this current test and compare it with what's happening currently in production or with a representative uh, time frame in production and then tell me, are we getting better or worse? And if it's worse, then stop the pipeline and throw it back to the developers. Man, I love that idea. <laughs> so yeah. that um, I don't know anyone that's doing that right now, uh, but I love that idea. And obviously, I'm starting to see like where do I put that in my pipeline? How do I actually yeah. configure that? I obviously, want an extension in VSTS that can read that config yeah. file, you know, and just and kind of wire that up for us. So again, to make sure I understand it, the test are the test. Those have been run yep. and defined yep. outside of this entire environment. There are metrics that you know that you can monitor already from the monitoring tool of choice, and in our, our case, it's Dynatrace, so that you know you have access to the CPU, you know you have access to the memory, you can count the round trips to the database and the latency yep. and things like that. So you know that that exists. And all you're doing yep. in this config file is saying, I've deployed a new version, I want you to watch these metrics, and these are the thresholds on those metrics. Yeah, or the thresholds, or you can say compare it with a baseline, yes, and the baseline the can come from a different environment. So perfect also for blue-green deployments or canary oh, releases, right? You can say, I just deployed a canary, I let it run for, you know, keep, keep an eye on my canary and only let it in there or tell me how the canary is, com is comparing itself with my, my current production. Right. I mean, and right now, where where I understand it's a config file, just a JSON format that you're yeah. using to define the yeah. metrics, but how are the results being then displayed to the end user? Am I going to yeah. a dashboard? Is it part of my CI CD uh, summary page? How am I seeing the, yeah, so the in results? My, in, in, yeah, I mean, in my case, and, and it would be great if you actually volunteer to put it for TFS. So I have two implementations, one for one of your competitors. They start with an A and end with WS. Horrible. Um, and I know, uh, <laughs> and, and, and there I put the I put the results in a DynamoDB table, and then I have a little dashboard on top, but also with links back to the Dynatrace dashboard if you want to have all the details behind the metrics. And then okay. I also just built the same thing for Jenkins, where the results will just be uh, an artif build artifact in Jenkins. Nice. No, right. yeah, we we need to talk about that when I'm when I'm there for Dev One because I would like to actually see that, and yeah, that's. That's really cool. I, that's like to the point where we need to make sure that that works inside of VSTS because that is just has my yeah. brain running right now of so all the cool stuff. And we have we actually have what we call delivery gates built inside of our release management product. And they can be custom gates that literally will run for as long as you tell them to run, validating whatever you tell them to validate. And if and only if this stays true, will it then say, OK, it's safe to go to the next environment? Exactly. Because we deploy – we use safe deployment for release management. So I, I think we talked about this a little bit in the last show. It goes through several different rings. And historically, we sit it for 24 to 48 hours in each ring as we monitor the things that we find important and if and only if they're good. And what we've done with release gates is we've automated safe deployment because instead of a human being having to go run a query to see if any new bugs have been logged in the last 48 hours, we literally have our tool go run that query for us yeah. and see if there's been any new bugs. You can run arbitrary functions inside of Azure. You can run yeah. REST API calls. And we could also wire in something like what you just described. I want you to go yeah. run – for the next 24 hours, this in production and make sure that we don't break any of these SLAs that we have guaranteed for, for right. usage. 
And then if and only if they're green, give us a signal that it's safe to go to QA and staging and all that good stuff. Yeah, and exactly. Very so cool. the way when I when I present this and I I did a meetup this week in Boston and I did some other presentations, I basically said, and as you just said, normally we have somebody that knows there's a new build. I need to run my tests at the end of the test. I look at the dashboards from my let's say uh, Visual Studio Load or from my JMeter or from my Gatling or from my Neolis, and sure. then I look at the dashboards and I compare it. But we can automate all of that. Because you know we are in 2018. I mean, why do I need to look at dashboards? Sure. And instead of instead of knowing, I need to look at response time and failure rate and CPU consumption. I can put these metrics into a config file, and that's what I'm doing. That's what we automated. And um, right. yeah, check it out. Uh, I will. You know, we will obviously we, we talk anyway. So um, I'll show you more, and then hopefully we have you on another episode where you show us or talk about how you integrated the whole thing with TFS. Um, no, no, I think that'd be fantastic. And once, yeah, once I know the plumbing, I'm, I'm, I'm already, in the back of my mind, I'm already, already teeing up people I'm going to have write the extension for us. So, okay. um, yeah, this is, this has really got me thinking. I really like this idea a lot. So that means what we, what people, the listeners will now know, if they want to get anything done on the Microsoft product side, get Donovan on a podcast, get him excited. <laughs> and get me excited about the idea. I will find the resources yeah. to go get it for you. That's absolutely, that is a true fact. We're, I'm about to do the same thing for two database deployment technologies that we currently don't support. When I got wind of who they were and what they did, I'm like, holy crap, we need that in VSTS. And we have a group of people called the ALM Rangers that are, they don't work for Microsoft, but they're big Microsoft fans. They're they're very influential in the community, and they're all technical. And they will come and fill these kind of gaps for us. So if you can get me excited and I can get the Rangers excited, we can write a lot of cool extensions to, to make VSTS do whatever we want it to do. Awesome. That's really and cool. I wanna, and I want to tell you one additional thought. I think it's not only about the classical metrics that we look at. What I've been advocating for in the um, – I call it the unbreakable pipeline. So the idea is you cannot push something through the pipeline to actually break the user experience of your customers in production. Sure. So we break the pipeline somewhere. Right? Uh, one thing that I've also been advocating is looking at the number of dependencies of your services. Um, so if I uh, – I want to treat my microservice – like I treat my LinkedIn profile, right? If I look at my LinkedIn profile, I know how many connections I have. And mm -hmm. if I post a, a link on LinkedIn or, you know, share a link, I always get to see how many people viewed this in my first generation of connections and in my second generation or first okay. grade and second grade. I think that's what they call it. So I want to do the same thing for microservices. If I push a microservice through a pipeline and I know that this microservice in the previous builds had one dependency in first grade and this one dependency translated to two dependencies in the second grade, then this is my baseline. Every time I push a change through because I, you know, I make a code configuration change, I add in a new third party library, I update a third party library, and all of a sudden the number of dependencies goes from one to two in my first grade and these two translate into 10 in second grade, then I should flag this configuration change or code change because maybe this change came in through an unconscious decision, right? We, we know this. So that's also why I, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping the pipeline in case an, an, uh, an unintentional change results in more dependencies. No, more dependencies that you're taking on, right? For example, you added a new uh, NPM package or a new NuGet package, which then had additional dependencies. Is that the number you're trying to track there? I'm, I'm trying to track the, the dynamic dependencies. So if, you know, the, I mean, obviously I refer it back to the data that we have on the Dynatrace side, and we see if a service calls another service, if a service calls a database, if a service puts something into a queue, if a service makes a call to an external service. So these are the dependencies that I'm talking sure. about. Okay. And, and if I, let's say I'm adding a new third party library and that third party library all of a sudden makes remote calls to a new backend service or a new or a database or has an additional round trip to a database that we didn't have before, then this is an additional dependency that we I see. I see. So I'm basically looking at the, at the actual dependencies between two services and how many interactions go on between them for a particular use case. I got you. I got you. Okay. Um, yeah, because I obviously see every hop adds latency, right? I mean, everyone thinks microservices are this silver bullet that come with no cons, but that's not true. And by adding, taking, for you taking on another dependency and not realizing that that actually is five more dependencies in the hops that you're taking inside of your microservices infrastructure, uh, you might not be realizing the, the latency that you're actually adding to your application. 
Yeah. Now, Andy, in, in, Andy, in your situation there, would you let's say you let's say you are under the impression that your new third party will add one more dependency. Mm -hmm. Is that something you would be able to define in your JSON file so that when you're checking, uh, it would see, OK, one new dependency added. That's what we were expecting. So I won't break the pipeline. Or is this something you yeah, so, this, so, so the way I see monitoring as code right now, you have two options. You can always say, compare my current metrics with a previous, with some of something else, right? With let's say the previous build, then it will automatically flag it. But you can also say, uh, I want, I have a, a hard coded number, let's say two as dependencies. So then the, the, the pipeline will be green if I have two dependencies, but if it's not two, if it's one or three, then it would raise a flag. So yes, you can, you can hard, if you know what it is, how many dependencies you expect, then you can put it in, uh, or you can compare with a different environment or with a baseline. Yeah, but I think that, that, that begs another question because I, let's say I want to compare it to production, but I know mm -hmm. that I'm adding a dependency. Production will still be at two. I've added a third yeah. that I wanted to add. It'll always fail, right? How do I get it into production well, well, with that's three? A, that's why in the in your file you can say I'm actually expecting one one additional. So when, exactly, you, yeah. when you compare yeah. this, the dependency numbers, we're actually going to accept three or a deviation. I of see. One. So it's, it's either or, yeah. but when I'm adding yeah. a new, so what I would have to do is that like a two phase deployment, or I wouldn't be able to go back to comparing to production until I've already deployed with a specific number as in my config file, right? I would say don't no longer compare to production because I know I'm about to break that rule, but I do mm -hmm. want to add one more. So to say, okay, you're allowed to have three. You only have two now. Now you have a third. I'm going to push you into production. And then the next, the next deployment, you could switch that flag back to now compare me to exactly. production because I'd never expect to go above that. Yeah, got exactly. it. Got it. Yeah. Okay, got it. Let me let me ask another question then in terms of the monitoring. I don't know if this fits into the pipeline build or not, but uh, this came up in a discussion yesterday. I was at a, uh, a DevOps conference, and I think it's something that monitoring helps with. It fits in somewhere, but maybe not quite sure where. Let's say you have, you know, whatever service you're writing, and you test it. It runs well. And you put it in production, and at a certain point, you need more instances of it. So you start spinning up new instances of your service on a specified size VM or whatever it might be. Now, that's all going to work nice, you know, very nicely. However, the, the big question comes up to is what size instance versus, so you're going to pay for whatever instance size you, you, you choose. Um, your function or your service has a response time as, you know, as a performance profile. So when in the cycle should we be testing what is the optimal size instance to run your service on for both best performance and best cost so that you can determine to say, hey, we're always going to run it on a medium size instance and we'll spin up those, in, those ones instead of running it on an extra large every time or something. You'd have to look at his. Yeah, you'd have to look historically at your. This isn't. This isn't like a, a, a just a, a wild swag, right? This is something where you're gonna obviously do some performance tuning in the previous environments. Because again, this is where the load testing and the performance testing comes in. At some point, you should have some SLA that you're trying to adhere to, right? We want to be able to have a thousand simultaneous users. And you're going to pick a size of a machine that you think is going to work, and then you're going to put it in QA. And you're going to run load tests on it, and you're either going to find out that it does or does not do a thousand simultaneous users. And that's where you're going to be able to turn those dials on. Okay, let's try a bigger VM. Let's try more memory. Let's try more faster SSDs instead. And you can play with tweaking that image or the profile of what you're going to be running, uh, scaling out, not scaling up, when you're going to need more load. And then you, can, you get to determine, so what's that threshold? When we get to, if we want to do a thousand simultaneous users, when do we spin up that second instance? When we get to 700 current ones or when we over go over that threshold and those are the kind of numbers you start to work on because again scaling out is completely different than scaling up and what you just asked on is when do we scale up the machine or scale down the machine versus scaling in or out our infrastructure right right and it's it's it's, it's twofold more one you know point number one from a performance point of view but point number two from a cost point of view and i guess from from what you're describing it really doesn't sound like it's part of the the pipeline it's more of the specialized testing in in something like load or performance that you'd be tackling that situation I, that's what I would historically be doing. And I'm kind of interested with with Andy's kind of ahead of the curve there on the way that he's comparing some of his other metrics. I'm not, I'm curious of what you've done in this area as well, because that's something that I would I would test out in a in an environment as close to production as I can get. 
I would know what numbers and targets I'm trying to hit, and then I would go turn the dials until I felt comfortable that I could hit that and scale up and scale out at the appropriate time uh, to make sure I don't drop any users or have a bad user experience. And then I would probably run forward with that until I would learn that that was simply no longer an, a sustainable or our load is so much more drastic and we hit a thousand so often that we're constantly having this accordion scaling out and scaling in. Maybe it'll be quicker for us to just go ahead and scale up an instance so that we don't do that as often. Um, there's there, there's all sorts of different questions I have to ask. And again, it, there are some monetary concerns there, obviously, because you don't want to be running a ginormous machine that only is doing 100 users for the majority of its life. And then it only spikes every once in a while. So I would look at our user patterns and determine what's the best use of our money uh, and then either scale out a lot of small devices or just sit on one big one that ends up being cheaper over time. Now, does Azure have any, and Andy, I want to get your take on that as well, but does Azure have, I don't know if any cloud providers do have this at all, I'm just asking in general, does Azure have any sort of API that you can interface to tell you how much your instance is costing at the moment or given a his, historical cost or is it all just well, I know at the that data is in there and, and we have an API for pretty much everything so I've never used it so I can't say definitively yes that we do but the fact that that data exists and almost everything that we do is backed by an API my mm -hmm. my gut saying I bet you I can go find that data in real time It'll be really um, interesting. but I haven't I haven't done it myself so I can't I can't say for sure but it's all available through through APIs that we can get access to once you have the right credentials so I would I would I would guess that we could do it, but I've never done it myself. One, one thing that I wanted to add, so I think what we are talking about here is predictive uh, capacity planning, right? I mean, you know the capacity that you need for a certain load of a certain component. And I believe what we can do is by keeping a, a close eye on the resource consumption of your individual services or features in your CICD, if you see, hey, that code change has for this particular endpoint, REST endpoint, uh, means uh, you know 5% more round trips to the database or it's writing 5% more logs or it is consuming that much more CPU, then you can obviously, again, correlate that with how often does this feature get hit in production and then you can you can kind of predictively, or you can you can factor this in into your, into your future capacity planning. Um, and, but more importantly, I think the first thing you, what you want to do, if, if any of these metrics change, raise a flag in the pipeline and then say, is this an intentional change, right? Do we add more functionality that justifies the additional resource consumption or was it unintentional? Was it a, a bug? Uh, was it a, you know, a wrong configuration change? Um, and, and then obviously it needs to be addressed before it hits production. So I think these are some of the, some of the things that I would add here. Yeah, but I think I think I, I agree with that, but I think it's a little different than what was asked, right? I, I thought the question was, how do I know if I'm running on the right size or not, and and doing mm -hmm. it the, the most cost effective way? Is that mm -hmm. not the original? Yeah, question? Yeah, that's that's the original question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When, yeah. I think in this case, you know, it has to be also, as you said, just as we did it historically, you need to figure out uh, in a, in a special environment, you know, what's what's the sweet spot. Uh, right. Now, what I've what I've seen though, and I've been doing a lot of work these days around you know breaking the monolith into smaller pieces so uh, the, the reason maybe why you need a big big box for running a certain monolithic app is because your your monolith just has certain requirements but yet we know that only certain parts certain features of that monolith are used on a regular basis but you still need to provision the, all of the resources because maybe some libraries need all that so what we are trying to do now with uh, with our work is to to figure out which components within a monolith are used frequently, what is the resource consumption, what are the dependencies, and then use this data to actually make uh, suggestions on how to break the monolith apart and where to break it apart so that you end up with, let's say, uh, one piece that uh, includes the, the features that are very often used uh, that you can then run separately from, let's say, other pieces of the previous monolith that are less often used and maybe even consume more resources, but then you can separate it out. And um, so I know I'm, I'm going into a different direction now with my discussion, but I believe the reason why we, why we traditionally, you know, provided a lot of resources to handle this particular spike of load is, is, is because we, we had to provision for all the features that were part of the monolith, even though on the small part of that monolith was actually ever utilized on a regular basis and now breaking it into smaller pieces and then being able to scale up and down these smaller pieces uh, obviously makes us more efficient more cost efficient 
And uh, and that's what we're also trying to help with analyzing the data that we have um, with with our monitoring solution. And it also helps you develop and move faster too, because it, exactly. it's much easier to deploy a microservice than a, than a monolith. And we're in that exact same world at, at at Microsoft with the Visual Studio Team Services product. There's portions of it now that are true microservices, but it originally began as a monolith called Team Foundation mm-hmm. Server. It was a one big everything was in there because you installed it on your own hardware, and we basically lifted and shifted that into the cloud as it was. Yeah. And we've slowly started to tease more and more parts away from the monolith, and nothing new is added to the monolith. Everything like the release management was a service, package management was its own service, uh, and we're working on like teasing apart build and work item tracking because as you pointed out, we might need lots of build resources and not a lot of work item tracking resources, but because they're monolith, to get one, you got to get them both. And now we're having to scale out bigger machines because they have to be able to sustain a whole new work item tracking, a whole new source control, and a whole new build when all we really needed was more build. But you can't get build without the rest of it. And so it's really interesting to hear you describe that because we're in that exact same cycle right now figuring out how can we tease apart from this monolith these services and use them as true microservices so that we can scale them up and it's funny because it all comes back to monitoring right because i got to know which one's the most popular and that all comes back to how do you monitor your application how do you get the telemetry letting you know which of those services are used most often so you can strategically start to tease those really high high volume uh services apart so that you can now manage them much more efficiently than you do as a monolith. Mm -hmm. And you can also take, there's two additional takes on that. First of all, you can say, hey, we now know which feature is actually very popular and where we make most Mm -hmm. of the money. And Mm -hmm. then maybe this is a good point where you say, all right, that's cool. Now it's part of the monolith. Let's build a new microservice that is kind of uh, replacing, it's going to replace that feature. So instead of extracting it out, maybe you build something new on top using some late technology, whether it's serverless or, or you know, microservices, sure. and then just use this as also a way to not extract features from the monolith, but just replace features, you know, uh, one by one until you are at a state where you say, well, now we have all the good features that we know we make money of extracted, we can deploy them independently, and now it's time to get rid of parts of the monolith. No, so for think, sure. Uh, yeah. And the other point that I wanted to make with monitoring, and this is kind of closing the, the feedback loop or closing the loop to your initial thought, is monitoring uh, in production and, and knowing what people use, but also knowing what people don't use right now is very good exactly. because if you, if you keep features along the way, right, and if you keep dragging them along because somebody – debt. It's technical – yeah, yeah, technical debt and business debt. I call it business yep. debt too because it's basically, you know, why keep things alive because one person – thought it was a great idea, but they have only anecdotal data to justify, but now we have real proof with the monitoring data and let's kick it out, kick out the things we don't no longer need. And it's really good to be able to make an informed decision. I I run a website and there's three different ways to view the core data of this website. So it's basically for people who race their cars. I race cars for fun. And when I used to go to the track, you have to fill out all this paper and being a technical guy. I'm like, why am I filling out my name every freaking week that I want to come race? This is stupid. This should be stored somewhere. So I wrote this website that allows you to go register for an event. And I remember everything about you. So registering is just a few clicks and you're done. And the track loves it because now they get these printed reports if they want to print them out or the data goes directly into their timing system with no error. So it's this great way of monitoring and using your your information. But one you can look at it as like a traditional calendar. There's a year of view and a year, and a month view. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm sick of maintaining this stupid calendar view. I wrote it 15 years ago. I can't imagine anyone's using it. And I was going to just delete it. But before I did, I thought, hold on. Let me go ahead and put some telemetry in here and say every time someone clicks on calendar, let me know. Every time, some, every time someone sub, uh, selects month view, let me know. And every time someone selects year view, let me know. And I let it run for a week, and I realized that I was about to remove the most popular feature of my site. <laughs> right? I was like, holy crap. I was like, I cannot imagine how many people I would have upset. Well, I knew exactly the number. Right? It's like 95% of the people use the feature that I thought no one was using anymore. And again, it was just all anecdotal. I never used that feature anymore. Anymore. I always use the month view. Figured everyone sees this as more valuable than the calendar view. Nope. I was completely wrong. And it saved me from making a huge mistake of re- removing a feature that I thought no one used, but I had the actual data that said that would have been an enormous mistake. And if you really want to, you can get rid of that year view because no one uses that, right? But here you are maintaining that code that you thought was valuable. And again, I love that because 
again, I'm not guessing anymore. Right? And that's what we had been doing for decades was here's our priorities. This is our product backlog. I know it's perfect. Let's just go do the top thing. Really? Do we know if it's perfect? Uh, because I added a feature that clearly no one was using and wanted to delete a feature that everyone is using uh, because I did not have my priorities correct. So, again, monitoring is crucial to being successful when it comes to DevOps. Cool. All right. Hey, having that said, I think we, I think this was actually a, a great discussion about how important monitoring and CI, CD, continuous delivery, and DevOps obviously is, right? Because with monitoring, you have the real facts to make informed decisions. And there's obviously different phases of the pipeline with different type of monitoring data or the same data uh, should be mm -hmm. used. Uh, any final thoughts before we kind of summarize and wrap it up? Um, no, this was good. Actually, it was inter one other thing I might I might like to say is that if you are a plural site customer, I'm not an author on plural site, but I watched a show on there recently. And, it, and the only reason that made me think about this was you talking about teasing apart a monolith. And it was this amazing show. So if you are on there, I think it's Eric Sutton's uh, about modernizing a monolith, right? And it, I would think it's it's an amazing watch. So and it kind of just made me think about that when I heard you talking about teasing apart a monolith. It's it's an amazing course on adding microservices to a monolith and doing exactly what you and I just described. So if you're a plural site person, I'd, I'd highly recommend looking up that, that course. And it's, and it said modernizing your ASP.net app. Yeah. A matter of fact, I have a channel on there. So if you go to, I'm not an author again, but I, they haven't, they call them expert channels and there's a DevOps mm -hmm. expert channel. That course is in my expert channel. I'll tweet it. So I'm at Donovan Brown on Twitter. If mm -hmm. you follow me on Twitter, I'll tweet it after this, share, this show airs. So let me know when this show okay. airs and I will yeah. tweet it so everyone can go and find it. Awesome. We can also add it to the, uh, the podcast notes. Yep, uh, that's that sounds notes. good. Cool. So, uh, yeah, Andy, I did have one thing I wanted to bring up um, only because this came up yesterday at the conference. So we, we spoke about, in, in last episode, we spoke about how, at least in my opinion, as I'm finding out, Dynatrace is becoming cool again, right? How... Uh, I mean, Microsoft core. is becoming. Yeah. I mean, Microsoft. Dynatrace <laughs> is always cool. <laughs> awesome. Now, well, there was, that, there was that weird teen period when it had all those pimples now. Um, <laughs> yes, what, how Microsoft is like becoming cool again, right? The, you have all these, you know, serverless, .NET Core running on Linux, all these, you know, all these fun things. And so I was, I was out giving a demo um, at, at a conference yesterday, and it was almost like the class, you know, hi, I'm a Mac, hi, I'm a PC such so that commercial, if you remember that, I'm sure you love those ones. Uh, um, <clears throat> so we had the first person come over and, uh, he, he stated that he works a lot with, uh, Microsoft products. He's, he's doing uh, .NET on windows. Um, and as we were starting, uh, a, a Java guy came over and, um, you know, I asked the Microsoft guy, so are, are you looking to do anything like eventually like moving to .NET Core, moving microservices on Azure? And he's like, yeah, we're, we're just starting that kind of process. And I said, isn't that so cool how like Microsoft is like really doing all these really cool, amazing things. It's, it's becoming cool again. Right. I said that because I, I, I genuinely believe it. And the, the, the Microsoft guy started, you know, nodding his head a little bit as in like, yeah, it is kind of cool. And the Java guy was like. Well, oh, you mean it's cool that they're just finally catching up with everybody? <laughs> and I just had to bite my tongue. I was like, oh, are you kidding me? Come on, come on. <laughs> give them yeah, some credit. It, the open, it's, give them some So, yeah, there's still, there's still an attitude, but I, I, I think I'm on your side. I, I, I think Microsoft is definitely getting cool. Um, I just wanted to bring that up because it was the first time I encountered somebody being snarky about it. I was like, oh, man. Wow, Can't you, haven't, you haven't said that. You, then you haven't had that conversation enough yet because yeah. everyone I talk to about it gets snarky about it, right? And they're, they, we're still the evil empire to a lot of people. If you're if you're not just coming out of college, I'm 45 years old. I remember the Microsoft that everyone is afraid of, right? Oh, I, yeah. I, so and, – and those scars and those wounds aren't going to heal overnight. We Just being the number one contributor to open source in the world is not enough. Having a product that we're releasing that happens to be – uh, built on Linux clearly is not enough. <laughs> Open sourcing .NET, running SQL Server on Linux, running .NET Core everywhere, uh, having Xamarin so you can build any language, any platform clearly is not enough. I mean, that should be more than enough, right? Because those those people who are coming out of college now don't see Microsoft like the the Java person that you just spoke to sees Microsoft. And I've noticed in the Java community, I have the hardest time breaking through. I, I did a talk in South Africa once. 
And they wanted me to come and keynote some conference. And I said, okay, that's a long trip. I'm only coming if you can get me in front of Java developers. And they were like, why do you want to talk about Java developers? I said, because we add value to every language and every platform. You get me Java meetups and I'll come do your conference. And they got me two of them. And I had to go in like under like disguise, right? Like you can't come in here and you can't pitch any Microsoft stuff. Like, no, I'm just going to tell you how we made our transformation. It doesn't matter. It works for any language in any platform. And it's just generic theory stuff. Like, all right, fine. You can come say that. I'm like, all right, great. So I come in and I give basically the transformation talk and there's no pitching there. There's no promo there, but I left myself like 10 minutes at the end. Like, okay, I just want to ask you one question, Java devs, right? So you're a Java dev. Let me just throw out a scenario for you real quick. And I just want to, to see how long this is going to take. I was like, so let, imagine that you have nothing on your desktop, no code, no pipeline, no nothing. And you can use all the open source tools that you want. I want you to write me a Spring MVC application. I want you to be running JUnit test. I want you to build an entire CI CD pipeline that goes from dev, QA, and prod upon every commit. I want there to be UI test run during your build. I want Sonar Cube integrated, and I want there to be approvals between QA and the production. How long, starting from absolutely nothing, would it take you to build that entire pipeline with a sample app? I've gotten anywhere from four hours to a week as the answer. I was like, that's interesting. Hold on. And then four minutes later, I was done. Right. I had built a Java application, Spring MVC, full CI CD pipeline and, and Visual Studio Team Services deploying out into Azure in four minutes. Right. And that's what it took for me to finally win them over. I literally had one person's mouth dropped open and did not close. <laughs> it just like it was like, what just happened to me? I'm like, this is Microsoft. Please stop thinking of us as the people that you hate. We can do this for your languages too. And that and I've been doing that at every Java meetup I can. As a matter of fact, I believe I have an open source meetup uh, when I get to Austria. And the whole point was so I can do that demo and say, Listen, you gotta look at Microsoft differently. We're not who you think we are. That's awesome. I love that demo. It, 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 people are always blown away. Yeah, pretty cool. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. All right, so um, Andy, do you want to do the summaration? Let's do it. Yeah, just a quick summary as always, uh, I believe, what we discussed. And uh, thanks, Donovan, for for uh, underst- for agreeing with us that the, the concept that we call the unbreakable pipeline makes a lot of sense, meaning we're using cool. – monitoring data from dev all the way through the different stages into production to make better automated informed decisions about whether a code change is a good code change or a bad code change. You started your discussion on let's first figure out what happens in production, right? And and then making decisions on how are our code changes actually impacting the bottom line, which is very important. But I think we can then take it from there and then shift it left. Uh, We discussed a little bit about monitoring as code, that concept. I'm sure it can be extended. But uh, great also to hear your commitment that you are dedicating resources from your team (laughs) to build something like this into TFS. And uh, and, uh, yeah, I think we all agree that uh, the most important thing is that you have to have trustable monitoring data and because only with that you can make really informed fact-based decisions and not just anecdotal decisions and we can automate most of the stuff and as you just said we can we have the capabilities now and the tools that allow us to build an end-to-end pipeline in four minutes as you demonstrate with your meetups and so can we maybe it takes a little more than four minutes but it should well, not, not take longer, but uh, to bake monitoring into the pipeline, right? And I uh, thanks for uh, thanks for being on the show again. Thanks for by the time this airs that you have been to Austria and spoke at Def One. There's also going to be a Def One coming up later this year in Detroit that we are hosting. Hmm. So a little shout out shout out there in October. Uh, we are doing a Def One in our Detroit office. Uh, maybe Donovan, we can. Um, you know, convince you to come there as well. There's a lot of developers in Detroit that are interested cool. in hearing that as well. So I'll give you some updates on that. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to continue working with you and promoting everything around automating the pipeline to push changes faster but more safer out to production. So I'm happy to work with you on that and educate the community. As, as, as am I. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, Donovan, thank you once again for 
for being a guest. You've joined the Two Timers Club, so congratulations to that. Nice. Uh, I forget, Andy, we have a three timer already or no? I forget. Have we, I have believe we, we do. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, all right, so uh, I'll be on the show at least four times. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a competition, right? I'm very it's, competitive. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you can have me back as long as I'm number one. I'll keep coming back to stay number one. So I'll every, be on the show at least two more times. <laughs> every, so, every time somebody ties you, we'll make sure we let you know hey, exactly. you, you, they have the you're first no writer number one. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, thanks again. And Andy, hey, I know, again, it's this is a little bit later, but hey, the, two years, right? That's awesome. Two years. Uh, oh, yeah. Two, two years, years of this podcast. podcast. And Donovan, we're so glad you're a part of it. You're, you're a very enjoyable guest. Thank you for being Thank on. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, guys. And congratulations on two years. Thank you. And thanks, everyone else. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.